Hello, everyone, and welcome to TAC Talks. This is the number three. Uh, I have an amazing guest for you today. He plays my dad, or I play his son, really, let's be honest. Uh, on Neighbours, you guys all know this. That's why you're here. His name is Stefan Dennis. We've had a few technical issues uh, featuring some three different headsets that seem to be causing a whole lot of noise and not helping the voice. Um, but today, hopefully, uh, and now it's it's all going well. So I'm hoping uh, Stefan's ready. Uh, and without further ado, here's the man himself. Here he is. Uh, <laughs> You're here. Welcome. Uh, Welcome. With my hair, with my hair looking like this, because I've been stuffing around with headphones for God knows how long. That don't oh, work. You still look beautiful to me. <laughs> Thank you very much. How are you doing? Yeah, good. This is a weird thing, isn't it? This whole lockdown it's, it's business. It's crazy. It's like normally, it's... normally you and I would be sitting in a room at work doing yeah. this. <laughs> We're about, I would say, something in the vicinity of about uh, 20 k's from which each other. Which is good. I mean, we're still able to do this, which is nice. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to, yeah, go on. <laughs> no, it's just it's just really weird doing all this because I've got to keep remembering to look at the camera instead of looking at you. See, that looks weird because everybody's going, why is he looking over oh, there? You still look good to me, mate. Um, but, uh, yeah, so what, what have you been doing? It hasn't actually been that long at all. I, I mean, it's seems like a lot longer simply because we are in isolation um, and it's it's uh, it's the nicest prison I've ever been in. Um, Paul Robinson's but, been doing But it's really weird. See, I... I what Paul was that Robinson's again? been th to a few prisons. <laughs> How many has he been? Has, uh, no, he's been in jail twice, hasn't he? Once for embezzlement when he uh, had to come back to Australia from wherever it was, South America, and the other time was when he went in because Julie Quill. Ah, Julie Quill, <laughs> who was actually played by my wife. I don't know if a lot of people know that, but my real wife, my my, my off-screen wife, um, Gail, the lovely Gail, actually played Julie Quill. Um, and she was the, ironically, she was the Paul nemesis which brought him undone, brought him down, and he ended up going to jail for something he didn't do for a Well, change. I actually had quite a, quite a few people ask about whether you prefer Paul being the rich Paul or Paul being poor Paul, which is a hard, that's like a tongue twister, poor Paul. Poor Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, I know it sounds really wanky, but I prefer rich Paul because he's more more devious when he's rich. He doesn't care as much. When I say doesn't care as um, less concerned about the repercussions because he knows he can buy, buy his way out of it some way or another. Um, whereas Paul, 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 you know, when he's on Skid Row, nah, not a fun guy. Not a fun guy. Oh, not God. A fun guy at all. I remember, it's funny because I remember the, the, uh, the, the people always ask me what was the most, uh, or what was the most memorable, uh, you know, time on Neighbours or, you know, the most memorable uh, scene or whatever. And I always say it's the most memorable time. And to me, when Paul first came back in, 2004, I think it was, um, and for a couple of years because he was stonkingly rich um, and um, in being so rich, he just didn't give a rat's ass. And so consequently, he, t he did tend to sort of walk over people and had a lot of fun doing it. And even though I wouldn't like to be like that and I don't like anybody being like that, by God, as an actor, it's good fun to play. I, I used to always say it was it was the most deliciously evil time. What's the funnest, Paul's, evilest uh, thing Existence you've got to on Neighbours, I think. <laughs> If that's a sentence. Ah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> um, probably uh, doing things like, you know, poisoning the waterways of Erinsborough uh, just to get back at people and, uh, and you know, blowing up Lassiter's. That was a good bit of fun, wasn't it? You know, <laughs> Do you know it's funny because it, it, what a lot of people don't realise is that my character, Paul, has got away with <laughs> grand arson and murder one. I think that's. I think you say those in this country, um, and, and and he's got away with scot free. Even when he realised, even when he sort of went through the whole, you know, amnesia, brain tumour uh, experience, and he went, oh, uh, and he got a, a conscience, uh, and he went, and he actually tried to give himself up, and he went to the police station, go, oops, me, sorry, sure, it was going go away, <laughs> um, and so he has. He's got away with it's Rod, not Rod Steiger. What was his name? The the Pepper Pepper Steiger's father, the cop at the time. Back in the mid two thousands thingies, you know, two thousand five, two thousand six, um, he he wanted to pin it on Paul, but nobody would believe him or Paul. Oh wow! 
It was funny. Isn't it? Well, it's very convenient yeah. in Erinsborough yeah, yeah. when those things happened, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What about you? What have you been? What have you been doing? Uh, up, boy? Setting up this. Um, I, I'm school. gonna. I, I was gonna. Th- I think I was gonna put put up a picture of the amount of time I spent in like private live rooms, uh, testing everything. And obviously, everything falls apart as soon as you actually do it. Um, but, but, yeah. As we yeah. Just well, I think I think at the moment, I, and people in the chat can tell me if Stiffy seems to be really delayed in his audio. I tried fixing it, but I, I can't seem to. Uh, but that's okay. As long as they can, they can see you and hear you. They might not be in sync with each other, but. We'll just run with it. That's what we're going to do. Ah, um, so most. Right. G'day, everybody out there who hopefully are this in a time and, and it's not. <laughs> Very funny. Um, <laughs> no, there's um, lots of them there. No, I, I, no the reason I ask is because I actually did an, a, an article for the Herald Sun um, for, and the question was, what do I miss? What has COVID-19 caused me to miss? Or whatever, what do I miss most because of, of uh, this, uh, you know, temporary lockdown with COVID-19? And I, I analysed it and I went, you know what? I miss certain things. And the thing that I pointed out most of all is I actually miss tactile contact with friends and, and family. And I know that sounds really weird, but it's like, you know, not being able to just put my hand on your shoulder and go, g'day, mate, how are you? Or, you know, give somebody a hug or go whatever. You know, I miss that. Um, but it's really weird because what COVID-19 ironically has done is it's given me time. And I don't know how many other people out there, but it's given me time. My garden has never looked so bloody good (laughs) because I've actually got the time. Gail and I have been out there with the kids doing gardening, but fun gardening, you know, hard work and that, but fun. And it looks magnificent. I was going to put online, I was going to put a a photo of a really uh, unkept garden and then a photo of my garden and going, this is pre-COVID-19 and this is post-COVID-19 garden and uh, and that's what it is and it's like and, and just before I got on here I was learning to play yeah. the guitar um, yeah. and it's just like stuff like that you know you, you 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 actually get time to read that book I'm catching up on all the TV and movies and, and, I'm, and I'm watching crap movies because I'm going at like you know 11 o'clock at night I'm going ah stuff it I'm going to watch that movie because I can um, and and the most important thing, of course, is I'm getting to spend some, you know, it sounds as cliched as what it is, but quality time with my my uh, immediate family, with my wife and my kids, and it's great. We're doing we're doing things that we don't normally get to do because there's always oh I've got to do that, oh, I've got to go to work, oh, I've got to do that. But it's like I don't have to do anything. There is no time involved. There's it's like Gail keeps saying, oh what about such and such, and I go it's all right. There's no time. We don't have to worry. We've got plenty of time. And okay, that plenty of time might wind down in a couple of weeks, hopefully, or maybe a month, whatever. But at the moment, there is no foreseeable immediate future in how long this lockdown is going to be. So we're just going, you know what? We can do that. We can do that. We're cooking things. Like I'm cooking stuff with my daughter because we can. Just making fun stuff, making, you know, like she made all, all by herself, she made uh, chocolate chip and raspberry muffins for everybody oh, for yeah. afternoon tea. And it was like, what? <laughs> yeah, it was just great. So we do, you know, we're just, and we're playing with the dog and we're doing this and we're doing that. And we went up and we played, uh, it sounds really wanky, but I do have a tennis court. And I was playing <laughs> tennis with my kids until nine o'clock at night the other night. Been isolation. You know, and, <laughs> well, I, I did happen to say that to my best friend and I said, oh, you know, what a shame it is. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm isolated on Dennis resort you know <laughs> awful and I, and I think you're right like and I think it's a matter of perspective too because I know some friends have really struggled with uh feeling like they have to be productive and I don't think you need to look at it as being yeah. productive it's not about I now need to go conquer the world it's it's no I now have the time for those things that I put off all the time that I really enjoy doing exactly. and it's like yeah. I don't have a I, I don't have to rush yes. it I don't have to put my pressure on to the, suddenly write that book or write a script or whatever it is it's just well Actually, I know I can go watch a bit of TV and now I'll go and uh, work on this thing because I've got some time to do it. I don't, but it's hard, I think, for a lot of people to to separate the two from that pressure of productivity versus time now to get the opportunity now to have some time to do the things that you normally put off that you really love doing. And that's the thing. And the the thing about it is, you know, and, and what I acknowledge all the time is there are a hell of a lot of people out there doing it really, really, really hard. Um, and, you know, one, I think about that and two, my heart does go out to you because it's like, you know, I'm very, very, very fortunate in my life being, you know, all jokes aside, being isolated in this acre and a half property with everything I sort of want and need. But there are people doing it in yeah. bed sits and one bedroom flats and all of that, you know, and they're outside spaces, a balcony. And I 
totally understand that. And I think that's where stir crazy uh, yeah. starts setting in. Um, but and I think it's it's the golden thing there is for everybody just to remember that this is this is a, a really fortunate and golden opportunity which has been thrust upon us uh, in a compulsory manner to actually pick that book up. Do that, you know, as I say, I've, I've had a guitar for years and I've been saying, oh, I really must learn to play that one day. And I don't. My drums, I go, oh, you know, I really want to have some time to have it. And my son the other day, he said, go for it. And because he was playing on the Xbox in the games room, which where my drums are set up. And and I said, oh, man, I really like to play the drums. I just want to have a hit on the drums and that. But you're playing. And he said, go for it, Dad. No worries. Go for it. And so he had his, his headphones on playing games on bashing away like buggery there <laughs> so good. and you know and that's the thing it's like i never get the because it's always a case of oh i've got to find the time to play the drums when everybody's out of the house and i do that because i haven't got a soundproof room and yada yada whereas now it's just like everybody's making compensation mm. for that for the fact that we're all in the house together and particularly now we've got four or five days of, of uh, rain coming along so we're going to be you know we can no longer go outside and experience that we've got to stay in which can be helpful for feeling like uh, uh the rain i mean can help because when it's sunny outside, it's everyone wants to go outside, but you, you can do do it to a certain extent, but you can't really do all the things you want to do. So when it's raining, it actually makes it easier exactly. to stay inside, I think. Which yeah, is good. Yeah. And it is, and there's so much fun stuff. I, I tell you what, we've never played more games now. Like, we're, fortunately, Gail and I, one, one of the things that actually brought us together when we first met, we were working on a show in Southampton and uh, at the Mayflower Theatre down there. And we actually met over, it sounds corny, but we met over a jigsaw puzzle. And we spent two weeks getting to know each other over this jigsaw puzzle, wait, wait, how, how did amazing. you get to the point of and doing the jigsaw puzzle together? I feel like you don't walk up to a oh, radio and go, <laughs> Yeah, no, we had a, um, we had a, I, I was given as a Christmas present, I was given a, because uh, it was Panto we were doing, so it was over the Christmas period. And uh, and I was playing Aladdin and Gail at the time. She was just, in fact, I think she was in her last year of uh, performing arts school at, in London. And she was allowed to do a professional show in that last year. So she she went and auditioned for a panto and happened to get a long story there. But it was actually, it was funny, Carol Todd, who was the director. Um, and literally Gail got the gig because she was uh, a brunette, not a blonde <laughs> that particular year. Because Carol had always gone for blondes in the, in the chorus. And uh, she said, you know what, I'm going to swap it up this year. I'm going to go for brunette. So she, uh, and it just so happened Gail was a brunette. But the, uh, the irony was they all had uh, black, weeks on anyway because they were playing you know Chinese uh, core in girls if you like um, and uh, anyway so yeah so we we sort of got into it and we're, we're into the show into the run of the show and she uh, I, I can't remember she, she just said, said to, and I found out that she was in really awful dig she was you know a dancer it was the first year out of uh, uh, you know out of living away from home she was just, she was a bit alone and all of that she sort of obviously got to know the other dancers and all of that and I sort of heard and and I said, oh, why don't you come and come over and I'll, uh, you know, we'll have a drink and all of that anyway. And we had and and this was completely platonic. It sounds like this is, oh, <laughs> sleazy lead actor doing that. It was completely and utterly platonic. And the reason I say that is because I was actually in love with another Gail at the time, Gail Blakeney, who I was working on the show with, and she. So I was parted from her and missing her. So it, there was nothing untoward. It was literally like, "I'll oh, come over and we'll have a meal, we'll have a drink, and all that." And and we just started doing this jigsaw puzzle, um, which was a, a murder mystery jigsaw puzzle. So you get unlike other jigsaws, um, where you don't, where you get a picture and you sort of, you know, you can see how the yeah. picture's got to come together. No, yeah. nothing. What you do is you read the book, and then it gives you. Um, you know, it gives you a rundown of how the murder was committed. And to find out, to solve the murder mystery, you have to put the puzzle together, which then has the, the final clue in it as to how who committed the murder and how it was done. Um, I think it was oh a thousand God. pieces. Yeah, and it's a it's a really hard one. It's a really, so really cool. anyway. So it took us two weeks. So over two yeah over two weeks we put this jigsaw together, and I I made um, I had a, a, um, a hotel room like a suite at the top of the Polygon Theatre, and in Eng England, unlike here, you're not allowed to do any cooking in a hotel room. Well, I don't know if it's right. changed, but 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 because I I was staying there for two months, I said to the guys down at the reception, I said, guys, come on, I don't want to be going out for dinner every night. Um, 
can I have a, a, a waffle iron, not a waffle iron, a sandwich iron, can I have a toaster, can I have a jug? And they supplied it all, so I made this little right. kitchenette. So I sort of wooed Gail, un, unbeknowing to me, uh, with my toasties, my toasted sandwiches. So for two weeks we were eating toasted sandwiches, drinking oh, God knows what, and, uh, and doing this jigsaw puzzle. How did we get onto that? I don't know, but that's the point of this. We just talk and things happen, right? That's so cool, though. I love that. Oh no, that's what I I I I, I did a Bill Con, a Bill uh, I was going to say Bill Connolly uh, uh, Billy Connolly there um, and digressed and went off on a track and I'll come back now. It's my family because Gail and I um, got together over games, jigsaw right. puzzle and games. We love games, board games and all of that. Fortunately, our kids have inherited that gene and they love board games as well. So. Back to where I was, we have played so many board games over the last less than a week. It's not funny. It's Did you been play great. Settlers of Catan? The Settlers Say again, what? Oh, you no. know great. Me and oh. love that board game. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, almost embarrassed to say we play a game called Secret Hitler. Oh, okay. Which is yeah, yeah, it's um, it's kind of weird. It's, it's sort of half of me is going great board game, other half of me is going. <laughs> <laughs> because it's about fascism and li yeah. liberals. Well, there's so many like yeah. non PC yeah. games, and they for, for the purpose of it. Amy's favorite ones. Um, yeah. Oh, now I forgot. I proposed with it, and now I forgot what that is. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oops. Oh, no, I can't remember. Black box. Someone on yeah. on chat will tell me in a second. Uh, uh, what is it called? Cards Against Humanity. Uh, which is all about, you know, saying oh, everything is wrong, you know. Love it. We have a Love massive yeah, box yeah. of it. And most of the cards we haven't actually got to yet because when I proposed, I got like, I bought like quite a, too much money I spent on this box of cards. And it's probably, you know, at least a thousand different cards yeah. in there because most people have the standard box and you get used to seeing some of the cards. But this is great because yeah. you can play with the, like 10 people and in the one night, there's no chance you see the same card because there's just so many to go through. Uh, but we will, we, once, once yeah. this whole thing's over, Amy and I have to come over and we'll have to do a big board games night because because we love them. So uh, that sounds yeah. excellent. All right, done, um, done. <laughs> but uh, to come back to... Party at Takaya's <laughs> house, woo -hoo! Um, Well, the, the house is basically done now because of I've been renovating everyone at home uh, because of this time too. I've, I've got one thing that I've got to wait for a trade to be able to do, which can't happen until after this. But And is it, is it are all pretty lights? Part oh, of yeah, I could, I, they're, they're a permanent fixture in the house now. <laughs> That's, you, you and Gail get on so well. She has got fairy lights I everywhere like on this I property. Like She's got fairy lights out the back. We did have up until a short while ago, we had fairy lights around the, uh, the perimeter of the tennis court, around the top of the uh, fence around the tennis court, which was fantastic. I mean, it must have been a beacon for the, because we're on the flight path to Heathrow. So I'm, I'm positive the pilots used to go, yep, we're on the right course. There's the tennis court. And... Um, but unfortunately, the cockies, as in uh, cockatoos, yellow-crested cockatoos, they like sitting on top of the tennis court and ripping uh, the yeah. wires. So yeah. Yeah. We no longer oh, have it's them. It's a shame. It's a shame. Yeah. Well, all the lights are up there, but they just don't work. <laughs> They're just still sitting there dangling. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Is that one of the jobs that you, you're going to get to uh, in this corona? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Fix the tennis court lights. Only problem is I've got to go out to Bunnings mm -hmm. to get them, and you know I'm, I'm going out as little Which as possible. Which is the best thing to be doing. How are the kids going? Are they, are they surviving all right yeah. in, in indoors? Or are they just sitting on the, the kids. games and not really worrying about it? Oh, no, no, they're actually really good because what's happened, and this is really brilliant in uh, the other sense, is because of lockdown, they, you know, the kids, they immediately just, they, they migrate to the, the headphones and the gaming console and they go there, or Darcy will be on the, uh, on the, she's on TikTok and all of that. And so they're in front of their devices. With her? Oh, no, I haven't done, oh, you? yeah, no, I did. I did do a That's dance it. with her. Which yeah, I look like a total dickhead. Let's face it, um, but I've done a. We, we want to set up a little TikTok thing, which we yeah, will do. do. Um, that's another yeah. thing. See, got opportunity yeah. to do that. But um, but yeah, I was saying. So they they migrate to all of that, only to realise that after a few hours, they're like, oh, I'm bored, and they actually come down and want to do something. Oh, that's so really that's nice. Good. Like forcing that family time, really. Which again, it's having time to do yeah. it because yeah. you know kids get home from school, whatever you want to exactly. go and play games and things, you know, because you've been yeah. at school. Yeah. It's like we never get them. We never get them outside helping us with the garden and, you know, we did a burn off and that. And we never get them to do it. But because they've been on the games and like, oh, I'm bored, want to do something, they were out and they're helping us out in the garden. Yeah, and then they get to learn about that stuff too, which is how I learned, you know, with my yeah. mum and dad outside 
They still can't use a hammer. I've tried to teach them how to use a hammer. I feel can't like the hammer's like the most the basic one. tool to use as well. I mean, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> They're like... <laughs> it's upside down, you know. Not quite. Yeah. <laughs> No, nah, they're good. They're good. They're they're they're, uh, they're not the uh, the most uh, ingenuity people. Is that the right uh, word? I don't know. Well, I don't know what you're trying to. <laughs> uh, well, it sounds like a good word. I'm I'm going to yeah, I'm going to claim that one. Ingenuitive. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's really good. Um, Oxford Dictionary claims a new word by Stephen Denner. Uh, yeah, go on. Now I read on Wikipedia today that. You hold, and I don't know if the, you still hold the record, but it says that you still hold the record for, uh, the, is it the most distance in an endurance go-kart 24-hour thing? 24-hour 24 24-hour endurance in a go-kart. But what happened now, this is the funny thing, because I haven't looked at the latest Guinness Book of Records. We held the, we broke and held the world record for electric, sorry, for petrol carts, 24-hour endurance. And it was myself um, David Brabham, who is Jack Brabham. I don't know if you know him. Very famous racing his driver. I know his name. Yeah. Um, who, well, well, David Brabham is now a very famous racing driver. So it was, it was David, myself, uh, Russ Malkin, who people might know as the producer of the Long Way Round, oh, yeah. with Ewan McGregor yeah, and Charlie yeah, Bournemouth. Uh, yeah, Russ has been a good mate of mine for ages. He and his brother Steve. So it was the four of us uh, formed the team. And uh, Russ organised it. Russ and Steve organised the whole thing. And then uh, so it was a team of four of us because obviously it counts as 24 can't hours. And, and particularly because it was February. It was February in Ooh. the UK. Need I say more? Everybody out there in the UK knows exactly what I'm talking about. We had to literally, you know, at four o'clock in the morning, you'd be chipping the damn <laughs> fingers <laughs> off the steering wheel. Yeah, with, with the ice. Um, so, yeah, there was a few complications, um, but we managed to break that. I, think, I can't remember what the actual – it was something like just over 1,000 miles or 1,100 miles, I think, in uh, in 24 hours. Um, and whatever the distance was, we broke the record by quite a few. It was probably about 60 miles or something. Um, and then the following year – and so, but oh, what I was going to say is somebody broke that record about four years later mm-hmm. – Somebody smashed that. Mm-hmm. But my understanding, and I don't know, and this is where I need to be corrected, is we actually, the following year, we set, which was in 97, I think, uh, or 96, we set the record for electric cards. Right. Same thing, 24-hour endurance, mm-hmm. same team with electric cards. That was hilarious because what we did it, on with the the um, petrol carts we did at Brooklyn's Raceway, which is the very famous um, raceway yeah. just outside of London, um, where oh, it's got an amazing history, that raceway. And anyway, we, we did a figure eight uh, course on that. Um, that's where we set the elect- the petrol carts. But the following year when we did the electric carts, the only place that was available for us to use um, was Santa Pod Raceway, which is, again, north of London. And it's a drag oh. strip, a, you know, the quarter-mile drag right. strip. Well, it was hilarious because, again, we, did, we didn't do a figure eight this time. We did just a, yeah. an oval uh, raceway. But the first... Uh, at least quarter of the course was rubber because it's where all the, oh, yeah. the cars take off from the start line. Oh, yeah. Of course, they burn rubber. So it's slick with rubber. Again, you've got – we were a similar time. We were doing it around February, March or something in the UK. So it was covered in, in Why do you keep uh, doing frost. it at this time, Steve? Uh, I feel like whatever. this. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, keep saying to, I keep saying to Russell, I say, can't we do this at Phillip Island? Phillip Island's a really great racetrack, and you can do it in the, in nice autumn or spring when it's lovely weather. Um, anyway, we didn't do that. I but think we should, we, though. I think uh, we should so start it was this hilarious. up again. Bonnie loves we it. We should. You know? We should. Okay. I think. I think we need to do. We need. Well, what we should do is maybe twenty-four hour motorbike. Well, I'd, have, I'd have to go get. From, I'd have to go get a motorbike license to be able to do that. But. <laughs> Oh, I'll oh, teach you. Um, but, yeah, but no, what I was saying, what was hilarious about the Santa Pod was because it was rubber and we had frost and, and ice build up on the rubber, it was just hilarious. But what made it even more hilarious is we blew up two uh, electric engines in the process, and but we also blew up the gearing. So all we had, we rigged it up really, really quickly because you're only allowed to have the car, if you have a, a mechanical or, or whatever fault, you're only allowed to have the cart off the track for X amount of time so before you So it's only the one car. It's, it's just, time. Uh, yes, yeah, you can change engines, but it has so to be the same got, car. Are you subbing in and out? That's my how, is, how, is, how, are you, how do you keep going? 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, um, yeah, yeah. So you just change, change, and they'd swap over batteries. There, I'm pretty sure. Can't remember. <laughs> Might have been. Can't, can't remember. Whatever. Anyway, it was it was nail biting stuff. But anyway, and so you, we only had X amount of time to do. So we rigged up uh, what we called a suicide switch, which meant basically you've got you've got no throttle anymore. So you go bang. The center of the steering wheel is this big red button, and you go bang, full power, and then you go pop. <laughs> no power at all. <laughs> so you basically, that was your throttle, and you had to time it so that you, as you came out of the the uh, the bend, the chicane, if you like, um, rubberized with ice on it, um, so you weren't going in just three sixties left, right, and centre. You'd you'd have to take take the power off as you're coming into it, and then at exactly the right spot, you'd have to hit the button again to get full power, so you'd rip up to the, uh, to, you know, oh, wow. on the straight again. And it was hilarious because we were just, it was impossible not to spin out most of the time, but we did it. We managed That's to That's amazing. That's amazing. How did you, how did you not ever go and do Top Gear or something? I mean... <laughs> Never, never asked. Crazy. Nobody ever asked. Well, they they are foolish for missing yeah. the opportunity because I think I, I would have loved to yeah. to have knocked off. Was it Tom Cruise or whatever was in the who was um lead in the leaderboard or whatever? I I always wanted to do that yeah. course. I wanted to do the you know the fastest yeah, me too. course. Me too. Never got it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's like I had my hand up for twenty years to do the uh, the Grand Prix uh, celebrity oh, race. Oh yeah. And oh. never got to do that, and which was a bit stupid because I was sort of. Race train. Maybe that's the, why you know, it's like, it'll be too embarrassing for everyone. Maybe that's else. the problem. Yeah. You should have said, "Oh, I'm terrible yeah. at racing," but it'd be funny. I said I was race. Hang on, I said I was race trained. I didn't say I was any good at it. <laughs> well, I think everyone expects you to be good at everything, Stevie, because you're you are. So that's <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. I'm just a hero. Uh, what, what are the coolest cars that you've had, or the the ones you like the most? Have you had cool cars? Had had or driven? Both, either. Well, I was going to say probably. I, I had the very fortunate uh, um, opportunity of participating in the 92, yeah, 1992 um, Cannes to, sorry, uh, London to Cannes Car Rally, which was a, an event organised by, again, Russ Malkin, which is where I met Russ. Um, and he and a couple of other uh, people used to organise that. And I think I can't remember how many years it went for. I think it went for two or three years or something. Um, and I and basically it was it was Russ getting hold of as many celebrities and sports celebrities and that that he knew of, and saying, okay, we're going to have three days and we're going to go from London to Cannes, to the Intercontinental Hotel at Cannes, and it's a three-day, and he, we couldn't call it a race because there were three categories of cars. There were uh, vintage sports cars, contemporary sports cars, and prototype future sports cars, of which there were two in the in the rally, uh, both of which conked out, I think, um, before we got to even Paris. Um, but so you couldn't you couldn't have like a, a you know a 1992 Honda NSX, which yeah. is a supercar, up against yeah. a 1928 Bugatti uh, <laughs> Sports. You know, they're, they're just the, the competition wasn't there. But so that's why they called it a rally. And what we had all the way along from, from London, who took the uh, the most fascinating camera uh, the photograph, of which myself and um, Paul Stewart, who is I, think we I don't did know, cut out uh, there you know, for a second, Stiffy. Um, oh, but I think we got we got we well, got that most of that. So, sorry. Ah, well, they'll pick it up. They'll read between the lines. Yeah. Are you are you are you still with us, everyone? I think I think everyone is still with me. I check on the at times. If people walk and if <laughs> you are uh, stop doing that because people will think it's actually happening that way. <laughs> um, yeah, everybody's <laughs> madly checking their jumpers. I, I think we're people in that. Sort of I, I can hear you right. perfectly clearly, and you've got a nice. Uh, see, I thought you just you were so interested in what I was saying, you were just frozen <laughs> in the moment. But you were actually frozen. <laughs> I usually am. If people in the good chat yeah. can tell me, so it's no, it's still all going. We're good. We're good. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you this. Day. I don't know where we got uh, off to. Anyway, but um, um, so this rally, anyway. We, basically, we had about uh, we had about three billion, uh, three billion, three million pounds worth of uh, exotic. Cars cars to play with for three days and it wasn't like okay you're in that one and that's it it was like i'm going to drive that one now and oh i think i'll drive that one now and oh we're going over down to brands hatch and we're going to race around the track i'll drive that one and that one and that one thank you very much so it was just absolutely brilliant but uh it, it was 
literally a schoolboy's dream come true. I mean, any any uh, guy or girl, there were girls involved as well, who has an inkling of passion towards motorsport, it was a schoolboy's dream or schoolgirl's dream come true. Um, and and yeah, dare I say it was just, you know, because of the sponsorship and everything, it was um, – it was completely red carpet the whole way, which was, you know, made it even more fun. But just the 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 thrill of the drive, the three day drive down to Cannes through all of that territory and all of these, uh, you know, in, encountering like we stayed at French chateaus and was this and that. I remember there was one time we had a um, uh, we were invited by the uh, the house of uh, Don Perignon and Maud de Chandon for uh, for a luncheon. And the the person who was taking us because because it was a big event, um, and they were one of our chief sponsors. House of uh, Moa de Chandon was one of our chief chief sponsors. They put on this big luncheon for us, and and the managing director of the uh, estate took us for a a, um, a tour through the catacombs where they've got the, uh, nine million bottles of nine Don Perignon and God knows how many bottles of, of Moa de Chandon. Yeah, nine million bottles they have in their catacombs. And I'll tell you a funny story, and I'll probably get into all sorts of <laughs> trouble for this. I won't. I won't mention any names, but there was a particular one of the one of the drivers partaking uh, in this event uh, was a very very wealthy man, and he he was also one of the chief sponsors in the, a, a hair care product, um, and he was one of our chief sponsors. But he wanted to be one of the drivers as well, just the same as there was the guy from who owned Ron, who owned Hawaiian Tropic as well, and brought all the Hawaiian Tropic uh, models along, and they all wanted awful. to be in it as well. Yeah, it's, it's oh, awful, yeah. awful. Um, <laughs> And uh, and they and anyway and this particular person who remains unnamed, he and his uh, fiance, who became his wife. Uh, well, you've got to remember, we're in racing suits. We had nothing. We had racing suits with two small pockets. That was it. And his fiance, this person's fiance, had a very small clutch bag, a small clutch bag. Um, that was it. We had nothing else. And this particular person said to the managing director of, uh, of uh, Maurice Chandon, Dom Perignon, he said, uh, we were looking at the bottles and he said, there's nine million bottles of Dom Perignon and they have to be hand turned every single day. So there's a team of people that hand turn them during the oh, fermentation process. Oh. And every single one of them is, uh, is, is serial numbered, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and this chap, he said to the manager and director, he said, can I buy one of those? And the managing director said, no, I can't. He said, no, 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 no. He said, I'd like to buy one. He said, name your price. And the chap, he said, he said, I'm the managing director of the house of Moto Chandon and Don Perignon. He said, I can't even have one. He said, they're all strict taxation, uh, serial numbered, yada, yada, yada. It's all government controlled, yada, yada. And and uh, this chap, he said, oh, that's a shame. All right. And he said, you know, honestly, name your price. And he said, no, I'd love to, but I can't. And uh, and he said, oh, okay, fair enough. That night we had the briefing for the uh, for the next day's leg of the journey. And and we'd have a dinner and sort of sit down, and have a few drinks, and then Russ would, would get up and and brief us on what had happened for that day and any sort of accolades that had happened and what was happening the following day. And he said, and uh, yada yada yada, and that said, so uh, you know, I look forward to tomorrow. But before we go and continue on with the meal, um, uh, such and such is going to come up, and uh, I believe he's got something to say. And such and such got up, and he said, um, yeah, it's been an interesting day. We had a really great day at, uh, at Don Perignon, the estate and uh, House of Mao de Chandon. And he said, uh, and uh, he said it was absolutely unbelievable to hear that there was nine million bottles. In the catacombs, nine million bottles at any one time of Dom Perignon, unlabeled, and still with the uh, in the fermentation process with the sugar cork. And he said, "That's amazing." And he said, "The thing is, tomorrow they're going to wake up and there's going to be eight million nine hundred ninety-nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine because here's the other one." And everybody just went, "Yeah, what? <laughs> Boom! Yeah, what?" And to this day, we do not know how he got that out. Or how his fiance got it out. Because they we didn't do not know. And we, yeah. we, there was a lot. There was a lot of speculation. <laughs> I can tell you. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> bodily cavities. But yeah, you know, we are talking about a bottle of Dom Perignon here. Well, some people are quite talented, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was an interesting. But we. But and and the challenge. I was going to say, Paul Stewart and myself. We. Um, we actually got the two winning photos for the uh, for the Kodak Challenge best uh, best picture challenge. Um, unfortunately, when we got to Cannes, the the uh, the manager 
of the Cannes Inter Intercontinental Hotel because we had all the the photos, the the um, the winning photos to be drawn to see which one was the winning one. Uh, on a, a board going into the ballroom where we were having the big uh, final dinner. And he said, he said, uh, I think I want you to take that one down and that one down, please. I do not want them associated with the hotel. One, because it was Paul Stewart uh, giving a brown eye at the entrance of the Cannon Intercontinental Hotel. And the other one was me outside um, my balcony on the top floor. Actually, I climbed over the balcony and I was hanging on to it with one hand doing a star. This is eight, eight or nine stories up or something. Everybody, there was a bit of a crowd jump. They thought it was a jumper. Well, well. yeah. So they get, yeah, crowd gathered from underneath. Because I'd said to, um, oh, what was his name? Oh, I forgot my team leader. Anyway, he uh, and I said to him, I said, I'm going to go and check into my room. I said, stay here, and when I get out, away from the balcony, get your camera ready. And he had no idea what I was doing. But that but was. I it. heard like so yeah. you, you, you clearly love the adrenaline. Am I sinking down? I feel I'm getting low. You are. Low <laughs> I've been like adjusting you to be. Uh, yes. um, no, but I, I, like I was talking to um, some of the publicity people from Fremantle, and they were saying because we you know I had those meetings recently about what would you do, and didn't oh. you say that you wouldn't jump out of a plane? Oh, you would. would yeah. Ah. Yeah. No, I would jump out of a plane. Yeah. I thought. I, I thought. Oh, I, why, in my why, head, why, I thought why, you, why, why you, you would wouldn't. And I was like, that doesn't. That doesn't match up with the guy who's hanging off a balcony doing a starfish. <laughs> no, no, I'll, I'll jump out of a Have plane, you done please. It I missed an opportunity. A golden opportunity. I had an opportunity to jump out of a plane about. Oh, it must have been about ten years or so ago when we were doing the neighbours' nights at the uh, at the hotel in, hotel in St Kilda. And one of the one of the sponsors for that night was the Melbourne Skydiving uh, mm. Centre, and they'd always said to me, "Oh, you know, if you ever wanted to skydive, come down, come down. We'd we'll love you to come down." I'm going, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." You know, one of those things. Once again, never got round to doing it. I'd do it now because I'm in COVID nineteen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, but that's except I wouldn't be allowed out. I wouldn't be able to touch anything. Matt Wilson would go and do it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. Manny and I should do it together. Yeah, shouldn't we? I mean, it would be perfect. Maybe. Maybe what could be fun is I could we could do a tandem together instead of me being strapped to an instructor we could just be strapped <laughs> you together know, not know what you're doing and and just go down like that the whole way going ah! one of these things we're supposed to pull right oh god yeah. <laughs> you're pulling my hair you're pulling my hair sorry oh. I thought it was a ripcord the one thing that I, I, I like I would if I had in a film to do that I I, would, I think I could jump out of a plane but I think if I if I was, if I did a film where I was a big, a big wave surfer, I don't think I could. I don't think I could go out in those waves and, and do that. Those guys are. Ah, uh, that yeah, that freaked me out because I I grew up well when I say grew up surfing that when I, in my teens, um, when I lived on the Gold Coast, I used to surf probably five yeah. mornings out of seven because um, it was easier. You know, <laughs> surf was right there. But yeah, I think. Even uh, I wasn't a good surfer just because I surfed that often. I wasn't a good surfer at all. I was <laughs> pretty crap. Um, but I, yeah, the idea of, I remember one time we had a cyclone on the coast and the aftermath of the cyclone obviously left a huge swell and therefore huge waves. And they were coming in at about, oh, I must have been out the back. There was a, a, at uh, Greenmount Beach and it's yeah. a, a point break. And you'd have the first lot after the point were coming in at around about six, seven feet. And then just beyond the point on the reef, they were uh, uh, they were breaking at about 15 feet. And I stupidly went, I'll go out and hit the big ones. And I'm paddling out. Fortunately for me, I got stung by a jellyfish, which felt like something like a shark biting me or something weird. Um, and it made me stop. And then I went back in because I think I would have been killed if I'd actually got out there to the 15 foot wave. Yeah, well. It's, it's it's just that thing because I like I'm a, I'm a strong swimmer. I've spent m most of my life at the beach. I can I love going in the water, mm. but just looking at a twenty meter tall wave, I'm like, there's so much power in the yeah. ocean. And I've had I've been dumped by a six footer or whatever, and then been sucked down and then panicked, you know. And then you're like, yeah. you like, I can't breathe and whatever, and you're pulling yourself up. Uh, and that's and that's just one that's just one wave, and that's why people find it very very hard to understand tsunamis. And they go, well, hang on, it's only six foot high. Why can't? But they forget it's the actual it's of six water. foot high ocean moving forward it's not just one wave you know it's literally the ocean moving forward it's six feet higher than it normally and does for all of the, the the uk people out there who do come to australia when borders are open and that kind of thing um <laughs> when they, yeah, when they if you go to bondi beach it's not a good beach for people who don't know 
what it's like to be at a beach. Um, there's plenty of other beaches in Sydney if you go north or south coast, the northern beaches or southern shire. I, I don't. It, Gail and I were saying that the, we were saying that the other day as well, and it's really weird. It's like that whole thing about the the, the big debacle over everybody went to Bondo when they were supposed to be in, uh, you know, ex, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Not experiencing. Yeah. I can't think of the word. You know, oh, uh, practicing social, self, uh, yeah. uh, social distancing, and uh, and you know, and there was that debacle at uh, Bondo Beach, and, and the first thing that came into my head was, okay, one wrong because you shouldn't be doing it at this time. You're being told not to, and secondly, it was like. Why would you go to Bondi Beach and be together like sardines? Surf, again, speaking of uh, growing up on, on the Gold Coast in Queensland, I used to always marvel as to why everybody flocked to Surface Paradise. Surface Paradise mm. was packed on a, a sunny weekend. It would be absolutely jam-packed. And you'd walk 200 yards away from that and you'd be on a beach, the same beach, but with hardly anybody around you. Yeah. I can never understand. It, it, a hot tip for anyone who goes to Sydney, go to Freshwater Beach. It's yeah. amazing. It's so yeah. beautiful there. At low tide, you can walk out oh, for like 200 so... metres. It's, oh, I love it. Yeah. Um, well, it's like when you, even, even when you go up to Manly, you go up to the northern beaches, and you've got that long strip. And I know that, you know, particularly for people who, uh, you know, are foreigners and they're a bit unsure and they want to be safe and all of that, it's all about swimming be between the flags and all of that. But as long as you're not going out too far and you're, you're, you're you know, practising caution and being aware of any sort of rips or anything, well, that, that's, I uh, think that's you know, if you feel the water's really a bit of the time, so then, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's 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 a, a rip is incredibly dangerous when you, uh, your feet can't touch the the um, the ground, the, the sand, and and even when they can, you know, if you're in the water up to there and you're in a rip, it can be very very dangerous. But if you're only up to your waist and you suddenly feel the water really dragging you out quite strongly, um, you know, when you when you're up to your waist or your knees or something like that, somebody would say, you know what, why go too too far on that one? Because obviously that toe is going to take me. I, out. Um, the first time I ever went yeah. on a stand up paddle board. Um, my, mate, my mate worked at a um, surf store, and so we, me and my other mate, um, he just gave us a board to go use for the day. So we went out, and it was really choppy, and uh, it wasn't great conditions because the waves were just on top of each other. So uh, you couldn't really – because stand-up paddle boards, you mm. kind of want just one long wave, so it's easy to easy to ride. Yeah, um, yeah. And so we got out the back. It took us ages to get out the back. The two of us on this one stand-up paddle board. We paddled around a little bit, and they're like, all right, we should go in. And he, uh, he was on the front, and then I was lying sort of on the back of him. And then we went in, and then – I just got mm. sucked off the back and then he went in and sort of walked off with the board. And I, w I was in this rip, but I was only about five to 10 meters from the shoreline. So I could see it. So I was like, okay, I'm swimming, I'm swimming, swimming, swimming. And yeah. I must've been swimming for about 15 minutes or something. Cause it was, the rip was just so strong that I just couldn't get to shore. I got to shore and I just lay there for about 10 minutes. Cause I was yeah. so exhausted because I was like, I'm, I'm too close to shore and to go thing, out yeah. and then go around and come back in. So I was like, I'll just keep, I'll get there eventually. I'm close enough. And there's enough waves that I should get pushed onto shore, but I just didn't for such a long time. It was very tiring. But for anyone mm. at, at home in the UK, if you do come to Australia and you go to the beach, if you get dumped by a wave, the, the only thing you can do is just not panic. Cause as soon as you panic, you're going to want to breathe. And you don't need to breathe. You can hold your breath for at least a minute uh, when you have to. So when yeah. if you get dumped, just relax, let the wave do its thing, and then you'll be able to come back up again. And if you don't panic, then it makes that yeah. much, much easier. Um, yeah. That, we, somehow we've gotten onto surf yeah. safety. <laughs> And, it, and it's a hell of a lot easier if you've got a leg uh, attached to, uh, sorry, a leg, a, a surfboard attached to your leg by a leg rope, because then you've got it's something uh, yeah. buoyant to hang on to. Um, so tell me about yeah. growing up in Queensland. Then I haven't heard much of, much about this. Oh, that was amazing. See, every, everybody, it's really hard because people say, "Oh, you grew up in Victoria," and it's like, well, I, I spent uh, up to the age of I think nine, almost ten in Victoria, uh, Victorian country, and I had an incredible uh, experience growing up in Victoria. Very, very adventurous. Um, and but then I moved to Queensland, and life changed completely. It started out by um, the first year we were there, my brother. I mean, it was <clears throat> it was traumatic. It was I, I say I speak of it fond, fondly, but you would think that I would hate Queensland simply because the first year I was there, I was in boarding school with my elder brother. Now, uh, my oldest brother was killed. My parents split up, and my mother met somebody new, and we had to try and. Uh, you know, uh, uh, um, get used to this new person in our life who, who, in our opinion, was trying to take over dad's position. And, of course, he wasn't at all. Um, and 
so you, you know, it was a very traumatic and and uh, you know interesting year. And as I say, you'd think that would make me hate it, but it actually, it, I don't know what, but I think just because of the age I was more than anything, um, adventure was on top of the list. And I, I was fortunate enough to grow up in Queensland and on the Gold Coast in Queensland, in one of the best periods of the Gold Coast. And I'm not just saying that because that was the time I was there and I'm biased, but it really was, the, I think the 60s, the mid to late 60s and the 70s was one of the best periods of the Gold Coast. It was it was when the Gold Coast had sort of established what it was um, and it was the beginning of moving into the new age. But So it was this kind of really funky hiatus in between. Um, I know that's a weird way of describing it, but it was... Um, it was just brilliant. It was a completely different world. You know, we didn't have political correctness. We didn't have uh, this. We didn't have that. But it, it, as a teenager, growing up in the sun, learning to surf, there were girls. There were. How old were you it was again? just. You it was. Uh, I well, I moved there when I was ten, yeah. and I left there. I left there when I was twenty-one, right about that twenty-two. Time when you are sort of getting into girls, I guess. Yeah. Experience, yeah, when life changes dramatically, you know, it, it's that, that period in your, uh, when, when everything changes dramatically. Um, and so I happened to be in this really cool place. And, of course, the other thing was I left home when I was 16, um, which my kids, they just go, <laughs> you're what? Um, and I said, like I say to my son, who's now just turned 18, and I said, when I was your age, I'd been living away from home for two years. I was paying taxes. I had a job. I had uh, my... I think probably by that stage, my second car, um, a, a girlfriend, a steady girlfriend. I was paying my bills. I was going out to nightclubs by myself without having to ask my parents. I was, you know, it's so it, it, you know, it changed dramatically in that sense as well. I grew up very, very, very quickly, um, but I still had the, I still had youth on my side to experience a lot of stuff. And we had, oh, we had. I, I remember, you know, it's really stupid things like I was talking about the cyclone. You know, to us. As a teenager, a cyclone was quite terrifying, and I remember going out in the cyclone and my mother saying to me, for God's sakes, do not go out in a cyclone because, you know, it, it, you forget that sheet metal yeah. flies around and this flies around. Yeah. You know, sheet metal can cut you in two. It can take your head off and because you would get these massive floods. And you, I remember surfing down, when I say surfing, paddling down, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the street, but street but down the down the uh the i guess the, the western end of the gold coast which never saw water and it was underwater it was under four or five feet of water paddling down this this road you know that we normally would walk or ride our bikes down um and as i say and experiencing really good surf at, you know two or three days afterwards and um you know experiencing beaches literally washed away and seeing uh boats up on the uh, up on the road <laughs> upside down and things like as that as long as it's not your boat that, it's <laughs> it's you know tragic for the people that yeah exactly. I was just going to say tragic for the people that owned the boat but to us it was like wow what the hell <laughs> they're not things you yeah. forget right <laughs> they're not things that you hey? can forget and like those sorts of experience stay with you so strong no what was the first yeah and okay and you know and and it also has incredibly fond memories because as I say I you know I I, I started work and I experienced work and I went from school from a you know, a nine till three thirty existence with my schoolmates and then going home homework yada 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 to swapping that and turning that completely on its head because I became a, an apprentice chef which is why I left school um, and so I went from having a daytime existor, existence to a nocturnal existence so my day used to start if I wasn't doing a split shift if I was if I was working in a restaurant that I didn't have to start working until you know 3 or 4 or 5 even sometimes 5 in the afternoon but normally around 3 or 4 um, I didn't get up until well what I would normally do is I'd get up go for a surf come home have a bit of a snooze and then get up again go to work go out after work uh, go to the nightclub or whatever, hang with my mates, go to bed at three, four in the morning. And people are going, oh, well, that's crazy. You know, don't, when you finish work, why don't you just go home and go to bed? And I'm like, well, okay, what time, what, what hours do you work? And they go, oh, I work from, you know, nine o'clock until five o'clock. And I say, and when you get home at five o'clock, do you go straight to bed? And they go, no, no, I have some dinner and I watch telly and I yada yada. And I said, yeah, there you go, exactly. When I get home from work, the last thing I want to do is go straight to bed. So it was, you know, there, were, there was all these radical changes 
to my life. I learned to ride motorbikes, you know, which I still have a, a passion for now. Um, I learned when I was 16 on my very first little Suzuki 100cc trail bike, um, which I loved. Um, what, was the, what was the um, what was the first, uh, so yeah you know the first place you moved out to at sixteen what what was that like where was that who was it with was it... oh it was really weird I moved I moved in with my brother and I think six other six? guys so it was eight of you into a uh, into a house oh my daughter's saying there's pizza here come and say hello to Darcy. everybody this is Darcy everyone yeah got to come in hello and say, hey hello this is Darcy everyone there's about four hundred million people looking at you at the moment. So there is 400 million It'll people watching us, isn't there? 20 seconds for them to, to be able to see you. <laughs> for the 400 million people to actually see <laughs> um, She's coming to tell me that we've got pizza because we've had takeaway for the first well, time. You guys have done well not to have takeaway till now. Yeah, <gasps> no, we've been cooking. This little what, one's what's been your favourite pizza, Darcy? Um, I don't really know. <laughs> you haven't tried them all. That's fair enough. You need what's to try your favourite? Um, meat lovers probably. Meat, yeah. All, all the kids barbecue love meat lovers. Barbecue or tomato sauce. Go figure. Barbecue. barbecue. It's got to be barbecue. There's a lot of, lot of people saying yeah. hi, Darcy. A lot of people saying hi, Darcy. <laughs> like, yeah. Bring the rest of the family too. I'm not sure if they'll all... It'll be like the Brady Bunch. <laughs> you know, Come on, everybody. <laughs> um, yeah. No, they're all busy, busy eating pizza, scoffing the pizza before I get yeah. to it. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I won't give you too, too much longer. But finish telling me about this house, though. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, anyway, so we got to, uh, so bye-bye, <laughs> Darcy. Bye. You can hear this, though. <laughs> bye. Um, we, uh, yeah, so we moved into this house, and I, the, the thing that I remember most of all with this house was the entire inside of it was black. We decided to, I, I, well, I wasn't part of the painting process, but I think before I moved in, because um, Chris said, oh, come and move in with us, because I didn't know where to go. I just wanted to move out of home. I was like 16. I was like, I'm going. And... Um, and my brother and I said, "Where am I going to meet?" He said, oh, "Come and move in, move in with us. There's me and a few guys. You can move in. We'll have you. You can share a bedroom with me." And I was like, "Okay, woo, go!" And I remember moving into this house, and it was at the back of the shopping centre at Surface Paradise, at the back of the main shops. And it was down this little tiny alleyway, really thin alleyway, to get to this house. Weird. I don't, I don't think it's standing still. And um, and yeah, I just remember. The, I don't remember what the ex, uh, the outside of the house looked like, but I remember the interior was all black. All black. Which was kind of good and bad. Yeah, it, the entire entire inside of the house was painted black, and I think that was to sort of oh. cover up a multitude of sins more than anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, but and then so we I think I managed to stay there for about two weeks before I went absolutely stark raving mad. Was that because of all the bugs? Um, <laughs> and just getting into your brain. Yeah. <laughs> and so I said to uh, I said to my brother I said I can't cope with this anymore I'm going to move out and he said I'll move with you and I was like okay let's go so we ended up myself and my brother and two three other guys and one girl moved into uh, you had just moved in. To the two, was it two bedroom apartment with? Yes, yeah, so two bedroom apartment at Paradise Towers and on uh, in Paradise. And at the time, this was in the very beginning of the seventies, and I think at the time it was. It used to be the tallest building on the Gold Coast at thirteen stories high, and I think by that stage it was about the fourth tallest or something building yeah. on the Gold Coast. And yeah. it was the height of luxury. This was like, ooh, people, we, but, you know, you it was one lift? of those, oh, where are you living? Paradise Towers. Did you have hey? Oh, we had a lift, man. We had everything. And it was like, where, where are you living? Paradise Towers. Ooh, <laughs> get you. And, uh, but what they didn't realise is there was six of us living in a two-bedroom apartment, um, one girl and five guys. Wow. Somehow it worked. <laughs> we made it work, but not for very long. I think we lasted about three months there. And then I moved into a duplex uh, down on Chevron Island, which I ended up staying on to and, and not in that particular duplex, but that, and then moved in with my girlfriend's mother and her uh, just That's around the corner intense. in another uh, duplex. Yeah. Um, in, yeah, that was interesting at the ripe old age of about Were, were you acting at this time or too? Or? No, no, I was still doing my apprenticeship. I, I did my uh, chefing apprenticeship and which took five years because I, 
I moved around a lot because I, I'd get very bored and I'd sort of stay at a place for three months and go, right, I've learned everything I need there. I want to move on to the next. And I did. And uh, unbeknownst to me, the apprenticeship board was going, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. Oh, no, 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 you can't move yeah. around like that. And they took my first year away from me and made me repeat it. And at that time, the apprenticeship, chefing apprenticeship wasn't three years, it was four years. So I ended up doing a five-year apprenticeship. Um, but literally the second I finished that, I moved, uh, I was married with my first wife. I just got married in a space of, um, I think, uh, uh, a was month or something I got with married. The mother that you were staying with or is this a different one? Yes. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. With the mother that I stayed with. Um, but in a space of, you know, let's call it two months, I finished my apprenticeship got married and moved to Melbourne. Wow. Um, because the, 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 well, the scheme, the, the, the schedule I had was never to be a chef. It was to be an actor. So that was and all, when did I that have plan this before. for you? Oh, uh, when I was about 15. And why acting? And it was, uh, and why yeah. acting did you say? Oh, no, I always wanted to be in show business from the age of, well, seriously, from the age right. of 11, I thought I was going to be in show business. By the time I was, 14, 15, uh, I went, I want to be an actor. And my dad very wisely turned around to me and he said, if you're going to be in show business, uh, I'd suggest maybe you get something behind you so you've got something to fall back on. Best thing he ever said to me. So I went and I, I liked cooking at the time, don't, don't like it anymore. And uh, and he said, uh, so I said, I went off and I did a chefing apprenticeship. But the, the agenda was always to get chefing as a backup uh, it's something to fall back on. So uh, when I was out of work as an actor, and it did for the first six years, literally before I joined Neighbours, um, I fell back on on chefing an awful lot. Do. But the best thing, well, the best thing I did was when I was in Melbourne and I did a couple of full time jobs, and I found it was unfair to my employer because as soon as a, a, a an audition or something had come up, I could be like. I've got to leave this job now and go and do that, even though I wasn't even certain I'd get the audition. I go, I've got to go and do that now. And my – no, I'll get it later. Sorry, my gorgeous wife has just brought me in a couple oh. of pieces of pizza, but I'm not going to eat it now. Arr, 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 you, really, you can ask yeah. me a question I'll talk. Oh. <laughs> I think that, you'll, there'll be memes of you around you know, the world eating pizza. Yeah, we're in the Italy now. Um, what was I saying? I can't remember. Um, well, actually, what I wanted to ask, though, is, like, where was the – what sparked acting for you? Where – like to, at 11 years old to go, this is what I want to do. Was there somebody who guided you there or was it just completely in you that you just knew that? It's, it was in all of us. It was in uh, my brother. My brother was actually the first one to get into show business. There's 16 months between my brother and I, my older brother. Um, and he, he was the one that was in show business. It was, real, it was always funny because he was the real extrovert and everybody always thought that I would go into business or, at, you know, when I was very young, I said, I'm going to be a scientist or a research chemist. And everybody, because I was quite academic and everybody went, yeah, that makes sense. Chris is the, the show off. He's going to be in show business. And Perry was, she was only a little tiny uh, mm. tot, tot at this stage. So they <laughs> didn't know, but they thought she's just going to be beautiful. And, um, and, but the weird thing was we all went into show business. Chris went out of show business for a long time and went into business and well, he went into the Navy at first and he came out of that and he became a chef as well. We actually worked together as chefs for a, uh, on a uh, couple of occasions. And, um, and, and then, yeah, and then he went into business, went into the hotel business and that, and then he went, he's now gone full circle and gone back into show business, but he's on the other side. He's on uh, behind the cameras now. He's uh, producing and writing. Um, he's very, very, very good uh, storyline writer, and uh, and my sister who started off acting, she's now a very talented uh, director, writer, and producer. She's just finished her second oh, wow. feature film, um, and I was you know I was the one that went into show business full full uh, bore, and everybody was quite surprised with that. I think <laughs> you were the dark horse, but I guess if everyone thought you were going to be the business yeah. person or whatever, then Paul Robinson was. Yeah, yeah, business. and then when the and when I when I did chefing and they went, oh yeah, that makes sense. Not realizing that you know I had a different agenda, and they go, oh yeah, that makes sense. He'll go into chefing, creative, and yada yada. And then I went and stopped that and went into chefing, and we were like, oh my god, what's he doing? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I think I think. I've, I've had, I think we'll just have to do a part two at some point uh, because I feel like there's so much more we can talk about. And I think I'm hoping everyone's found this really yeah. interesting because I, I definitely have. Um, 
because we, we basically didn't even talk about neighbors or even getting to neighbors. Uh, with, I feel like we've got this, this neighbors. Is, is are you talking about my neighbors or are you talking about some show that nobody knows? <laughs> Both, about? Maybe, I don't know. Um, but, uh, but it's a, uh, but I feel like I really want to explore that period between where you are right now, where you were then, and then that neighbors spot and how that developed. Cause I imagine there's some crazy stories in there as well. Um, so we'll definitely have to do a part two if you're oh, yeah. open to it at some point. Um, I'll be open to that. I'm, Hey, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Good. Good, as no one should. You should all be using your hand sanitizer yeah. when you can. Yeah, got that. Yeah, don't touch ah. your face. I, ah. I'm at ah. home. I'm at home. It's all right. Ah, ah, ah. Uh, all right. Well, thank you very much, Stephen Dennis, for joining us. Oh, thanks, mate. You know, it's been good fun, even though we can't see it. Um, no, hello. Uh, <laughs> I can't give you a hug and say hello. I'm doing it um, hypothetically, not hypothetically. What do you call it? By remote. By remote. Telepathically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and everybody who's uh, listening to that, the, the 400 million who are watching this and listening to this, I hope you're all doing okay. It's uh, it's a weird and strange and very, very tough time for a lot of people. So, uh, yeah, I, I genuinely, I, not just me, but, I, you know, all of us and most everybody in the world at the moment, our hearts go out to everybody. And we are, it's, it's, it's a time when we are all thinking about everybody else, even though we can't touch you and, and uh, see you, in, uh, you know, physically. It's, yeah. Hang in there, guys. All right. Well, stay on the line. Uh, but thank you, uh, Stephen Dennis, for joining us. That's the end to... Stephen, Stephen <laughs> Dennis? <laughs> what part well, of New Zealand are you from now? Say, <laughs> Stephen, but then I'm like, I should have to say that. So <laughs> okay. that's, another, that's a whole new episode, why I'm called Stephen. <laughs> that could be a whole episode. Actually, no, we'll, start, we'll, we'll do it now. We'll do it. Do you know I why I'm called no Stephen? I, I, I have no idea. I think I've told you. I have no idea. I have no idea. I know. I, I thought I'd told you this. Okay, it, it, it's a derivative because everybody goes, ooh, Stiffy, <laughs> eh? Ooh. No, it, no. For all of you narrow minded people out there thinking below your navels, it's got nothing to do with that. Mind you, I wish it was. No, um, it's because Alan Dale, dad on that. Hopefully, going back in a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alan Dale, who plays your grandfather, my father, on the show, um, he used to call me me i don't know it just came out of the the blue because my name's stefan and um and nobody's allowed to call me steffi other than my immediate family and steve mann if you're ever listening to this um and fiona <laughs> she's allowed to call me steffi um but and so i didn't like and so he just out of the blue he said to me one day and he called me stiffles Stiffles. And it was like a, it was the same as like Tigger or something like It was a little nickname. He called me Stiffles and he started calling me. And basically, Stiffles got shortened to Stiffy. Right. <laughs> Stiffles. And that's why I'm called Stiffles. Maybe I'll call you Stiffles from now on. I like that. That's really good. Uh, yeah, you can. I'll answer to that. Yeah. Sure. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Stiffles. <laughs> that. <laughs> that's really good. Wait, actually, oh, one question I did have your Twitter, Dendale. What's that from? Oh, that's a that's a uh, combination of mine and Gail's surname. Ah, okay, that makes sense. Dennis and Easdale, yeah. We've had Dendale for as long as we can remember. Ah, well, that's good. All right, well, thank you, Stiffles. <laughs> God, now I've got to try and lock that in. <laughs> lock that in. All right, that's the end to Tac Talks number three. Uh, I hope you guys all enjoyed that. I really had a lot of fun just then, uh, and I do definitely want to do a part two. Um, so I'll be up for that. make sure that you subscribe, uh, hit the button that's – over here or something um, so that you know when we're on next uh, because I'm really enjoying doing this. I want to keep doing it um, and I hope I can bring you as many guests as I can. Uh, once I work my way through the neighbors cast as much as I can, I'm going to try and uh, see some, find some other actors as well that I know who are doing really well overseas and that kind of thing as well and try to keep this going uh, as well as I can. When we start shooting again, I might find it a little bit difficult, but for right now, uh, I hope you've had a good time. Hit the subscribe, hit the like, uh, comment at the bottom if you're watching this later. I want to hear your thoughts um, but I've had a really good time uh, so thanks for joining us I hope you to see you tomorrow oh actually I've got to do the announcement uh, for who is on today uh, tomorrow sorry our next guest guest or guests two of them that's hard to say guests um, are Bonnie Anderson and Rob Mills uh, which is going to be a really really fun chat tomorrow um, these two, obviously, we'll be talking a lot about 
uh, end game. These two had a big part to play in that. Um, so come along and join us 5.30 tomorrow. I'm going to be doing this every weeknight while we're locked down. And then once we start back up, I'll see how I go because um, we can get quite busy on set. Uh, but I want to try and keep this going if I can. Um, so again, thank you for joining us. Thank you to Stiffles, Stefan Dennis. Uh, he's been brilliant. Uh, and I hope to see you all next time. And now I've got to turn this off awkwardly. <laughs>